Hi guys, I'm Kristen. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to those of you who are here for the first time. In today's video, I'm going to help you figure out where you should start reading with Juliette Morellier. Juliette Morellier is a New Zealand-based historical fantasy author with a huge back catalogue. Her books tend not to be talked about all that much on booktube, but so many readers want to start reading Juliette Morellier and have no idea where to start other than a couple obvious books to go with. I am a huge Julia Morelia fan and I have been in love with her books basically since I started reading, so I really wanted to take the opportunity today to talk about where you should start reading if you want to try out Juliette Morellier's works. Her back catalog is actually huge. She has seven completed series with over 20 books and four additional standalones, including a collection of short stories. For time's sake today, I am only going to go over the adult fantasy series, so I'm not going to be talking about the young adult series or the standalone books today. But if that's something that you would like to see in the future, you can absolutely let me know in the comments down below. People tend to go to Juliet Morellier for beautifully written, atmospheric, and environmental woodsy books. You are going to get a beautifully descriptive, atmospheric, woodsy setting, usually with a lot of fairy tale and folklore components or inspiration or retellings in her books. Her main characters are usually kind, warm-hearted, good people who just want to do the right thing, but her books tend to be just so immersive with the setting and you're going to get a beautifully heartwarming and sorrowful experience with so many of her books. The pacing is always going to be a little bit on the slower or quieter end of things. They are usually very descriptive with the setting and the setting is usually really, really important to the story or to the characters at large. From a magical component, they are never hard magic systems. It's usually just sort of the stories or the beliefs of that time, like involving fae and fairy circles and like a trickster fae involvement. That kind of thing is usually just made real. Another thing to probably be aware of from a series perspective is that her series tend to be generational. So you are within a series not always going to follow one particular character. We are usually following a generational pattern. I do know that that is a con for a lot of people, so it's something to be aware of going into. A possible con, or at least something to just consider if this is going to bother you, is to go in knowing that these are historical fantasies, and Julia Murley does a lot of research to make sure that they are generally pretty accurate to the time that they are being specifically set in. While she does make some changes, she does tend to be fairly accurate in the ages of the characters involved, particularly from a romantic standpoint. Which means that in a few of these series, there is a bit of an age gap in the romantic pair with some of the girls being on a slightly uncomfortably younger side. This is something that I have chosen to accept about this time period and these books, but that doesn't mean that you have to, so I will try to let you know if I remember when we get to the series where that is a factor. Without further ado, let's jump into the series now. So I'm going to go through just the adult fantasy series, as I mentioned, which there are five series, and I'm going to tell you a little bit of a synopsis, what to expect, what the vibe or feel of that book is going to be, and whether or not I think it would be a good place to start reading Juliette Morellier. I feel like I'm going to get a little hand wavy when talking about these series, so I'm going to set my tea down and let's start with the obvious choice here and talk about the Seven Waters series, beginning with the book Daughter of the Forest. This is the one that you've probably heard of. Daughter of the Forest is a huge fan favorite and is my particular personal favorite book of all time. The Seven Waters series is six complete books, but it is distinctly in feel and I think in like timing and the, in the format and approach. It is two separate trilogies that take place back to back chronologically. The first three books, Daughter of the Forest, Son of the Shadow, and Child of the Prophecy, do follow the generational pattern where our main character in the first book, Sorsha, is one person. In the next book, we follow a child of hers, and in the book after that, we follow a child from the next generation down, but not the child of the character in the second book. Now the series then switches up a little bit, and in the next three books, we actually follow three separate sisters of that same generation from the third book. And the books in the second trilogy are Heir to Seven Waters, Seer of Seven Waters, and Flame of Seven Waters. Honestly, this is a great point of entry for Juliet Morelia books as they are undoubtedly a fantastic representation of her writing style and the feel and vibe of her books. 
I'm going to talk about the two trilogies within this series separately. So starting with the first three, Daughter of the Forest, Son of the Shadow, and Child of the Prophecy. The first book is a fairy tale retelling. It is the Six Swan Brothers retelling by Brothers Grimm. We follow our main character, Sorcia, whose six brothers have been turned into swans by an evil sorceress. And we follow on her journey of completing various tasks or like one large specific task in order to set her brothers free. This is a story of sacrifice and suffering. It is a journey of hard work and perseverance. It has a beautiful romance and a very distinct cast of characters with no one brother feeling exactly the same as the others. Told from Sorcia's perspective, it is a very immersive read and you will feel like you are right there with her along the whole journey which means that it can also be a challenging and potentially uncomfortable read, so I do recommend checking out the content warnings on that book in particular. While Sorcia's story does have a complete story arc, there is a world political problem going on that does not end, and that is what extends over the first three books in the series. So that is what will continue as we follow the generational pattern in that first three books, or in those first three books. The second three books, Heir to Seven Waters, Seer of Seven Waters, and Flame of Seven Waters have a different magical problem that is happening. This one follows three separate sisters, not all in the same setting. In fact, the second book or like the fifth book in the series, Seer of Seven Waters is set in a completely different location, but is actually my favorite of those three. And I would say if you are thinking about reading this series, I would honestly maybe stop after the first three and I would go on to different Juliet Morelia books which I think are better than the second trilogy in this world. These three books are just not quite the same. They don't have the same feeling and vibe as the first three books do, and they actually feel a little bit more young adult in the story. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are, I don't think that they technically are, but they have a very different feel and quality than the first three books in the series. So I wouldn't necessarily put those three books high up on the priority list of like reading through Juliet Morelia. I think there are other better places to go if you like the first three books and are looking for more Juliet Morelia books to read. Now there is one small con with starting with Daughter of the Forest, and that is that it is quite possibly her best book and all the others might not live up to the feeling and the experience that you get in that first book. But obviously everyone is going to resonate with a different character or a different plot or a different story and so that might not be the case for you but do know that it is a possible risk of starting here something additional to note here just before moving on is that book number three in this series child of the prophecy and book number six flame of seven waters both have physical disability rep so what are some other possible starting places with Juliet Morillet? Another place to go might be to consider the Saga of the Light Isles, which is a duology that is Scandinavian inspired. It could also be where you go next after Daughter of the Forest. This duology includes the books Wolfskin and Fox Mask. It is another generational one. So in Wolfskin, we actually follow two characters and in the second book, which is the children of people from the first book, I won't say whose children or whatever. If you are looking in particular for like a rich environmental feel and a fairy tale or folklore feeling-esque story, I think Wolfskin is a great book and often an underrepped or under-talked about book of Juliet Merlier's. This is absolutely a debatable statement I'm about to make, but I personally think that Wolfskin is the one that feels the most like a folklore or a fairy tale story. It's a little bit more distant, but it feels really atmospheric and you feel the vibe of the story so intensely in the way that you would really, really reading a fairy tale. I'll just briefly talk about the synopsis here. So this story follows Ivan, who is a young boy growing up in like a Scandinavia type place. And all he wants to do growing up is to be a wolfskin, which is kind of like a Viking berserker kind of a person, a warrior dedicated to one of their gods. Now, when Ivan is young, he meets the boy Summerled, who is the younger son of a chieftain. And despite the fact that the two are extremely different people, Summerled being a lot more intellectual, cunning, smart, less physically adept than uh, Ivan, the two become fast friends and develop a blood brotherhood kind of relationship. And eventually when they are grown, both end up going on a journey to settle the Light Isles, which are historically the Orkney Isles. It's at this point that we get an additional POV added in, which is Nessa. She is the niece of the King of the Light Isles and a priestess of their faith. And then the book follows this developing colony and the interactions between the two cultures as things start to go awry. 
in this book, there's a little bit of an exploration around brotherhood. There is a small romance. There is some questionable circumstances surrounding a death. And the focus really is on this tense and unlikely friendship between Ivan and Summerlid and the extent to which loyalty should go. This book deals with more dark and ominous themes and content. The book feels very ominous as you are reading it because you know that things are going to go badly. And so it feels a lot more dark and shady in tone than the majority of her other works. The atmospheric setting of this book really brings the story to life and highlights her ability to write you into a scene with these characters. Even though it's not a deep character dive, you feel like you are right there with the characters because of the way Juliet Marillier can write a setting. You are just so immersed in where you are, it adds an extra element to the tone of the book. And then, as I said, Fox Mask is the next generation in this world. I won't go into the plot here on this one, but I'll just say the themes in both of the books in this duology has a lot to do with this idea of like a strong personal growth of people and characters in particular who are very naive and very trusting. This means that they can be really frustrating to read about because they are naive and loyal and trusting to a fault, but that needs to be there in order to have the character arc that these characters in both of the books in this duology go through. And there's a huge overarching theme in seeing people for who they truly are. Now you absolutely could read Wolfskin as a standalone book. It has a complete end. There is not an ongoing storyline that is extended. It's more just like if you want to see what happens in the next generation with where things leave off after the end of the first book, you can then read Fox Mask. Now, if you are looking for something that is a little bit more cozy woodsy with like a magical mystery and older main characters, then you should check out the Blackthorn and Grimm series. This series technically takes place in the same world as Seven Waters. It is sort of in a similar location or like the same country, which is Ireland, but they are not connected in any way. You don't need to read one or the other in any particular order. They're not connected. They just happen to be in the same world. But where those two series then meet is in the Warrior Bards trilogy, which I will talk about in a bit. But to talk about Blackthorn and Grimm here, we are talking about the three books, Dreamer's Pool, Tower of Thorns, and Den of Wolves. The premise for this series is that the night before her intended execution, Blackthorn is visited in prison by a fae who gives her a possible deal for escape. It has a bunch of details that I won't go into, but the main one is that essentially for the length of seven years, Blackthorn has to agree to help anyone that asks it of her. And for the length of those seven years, she's not allowed to seek justice or vengeance against the person who has wrongfully imprisoned her. Grimm is a fellow prisoner and he is accidentally released when Blackthorn is and he decides to follow her as her companion. The books have quite a quiet or slower pace with little bits of slice of life as Blackthorn and Grimm settle into their new home in the small village where they are settling. Each book features a specific mystery that Blackthorn has been asked to help with. There is usually an element of folklore or magic involved in these mysteries. They are kind of like quiet, simple, straightforward mysteries. They're not page turners and it is possible possible that you will be able to figure them out much sooner than Blackthorn or Grimm does. And then in this series, we are actually following Blackthorn and Grimm in each of the three books with each of the three mysteries. And the overarching tying thing here, like the overarching plot, is the backstories of Blackthorn and Grimm themselves. Now, in each of the three books, we get Blackthorn and Grimm's perspectives, as well as an additional third perspective that has to do with the mystery in each of the three books. The writing in each POV is actually very distinct, and Juliet Merle uses different changes in tense, actually, to distinguish the three POVs, which is something that you might notice it, you might not notice it, but it does feel really distinctive when you are in each person's head. The series is much slower moving and character focused. As I said, it is very possible that you will be able to figure out the mysteries, but I generally view the mysteries as a little bit more of atmosphere setting and a little bit of structure as we just explore and go through trauma recovery with Blackthorn and Grimm. They both have very traumatic experiences and pasts that have gotten them to the place of them being in that prison where we found them in the first book. They are also older characters. They are probably in their late 20s, early 30s or mid 30s. 
And thematically, we deal not only with trauma and post-traumatic stress, but we also spend quite a bit of time looking at women's issues in particular with a very modern view um, for the setting that we're in here. Now, Blackthorn is a more gruff, unlikable character. She has been through a lot and she's kind of a no-nonsense, angrier main character to follow. But she also has a really strong sense of right and wrong and Blackthorn is not afraid to stand up for what she believes is right or to stand up for the sake of others who she feels is being wronged. Grimm, on the other hand, is sort of your strong, silent, giant type. He has a lot more hope and belief in the goodness of people compared to Blackthorn. He is a very stalwart companion to Blackthorn, and the two support each other in a very genuine and trusting way through their traumas. On that note, I would definitely check out the content warnings for this book. I forgot to mention it for Wolfskin. There is also some stuff there that you should check out. I think you should just generally check out content warnings when reading Julia Marillier as like a, a broad disclaimer. But if you're looking for something that is a little bit cozier but still confronting and a more character focused environmental read, then the Blackthorn and Grimm series is a great place to go. Jumping out of publication order now, I think it is a good idea to talk about Warrior Bards because it is related to the Blackthorn and Grimm series. Warrior Bards is Juliette Marillier's most recent series and this includes Harp of Kings, A Dance with Fate, and A Song of Flight, I believe. Now I know when some readers are considering starting reading or looking into reading from a new author, the there's often a common strategy of either going all the way back in their back catalog, so that would be starting with Seven Waters, the first things that they published, or reading the most recent things that they've published with the thought process there that it is probably their best that they have done. And in this case, you should absolutely not do that. I do not think that Warrior Bards is the best thing that Juliet Marillia has written. I think it is by far not the best thing that she's written, and I don't think that it is the most representative of her works and her writing at large. So I do not think that Warrior Bards is a good place to start, not only for that reason, but also because of its connection to Blackthorn and Grimm. As I said, Warrior Bards is set in the same world as Seven Waters and Blackthorn and Grimm. In the case of Seven Waters and Blackthorn and Grimm, this was not necessary to have read both of them as they weren't really connected. The connection between Seven Waters and Warrior Bards is simply the setting. The location that Warrior Bards takes place in is a place and a mercenary group that is established in the Seven Waters series. So that's really the main context there. It is just a setting connection. There are some Easter eggs, but it's not necessary for understanding Warrior Bards at all. You don't have to read Seven Waters first. Now, the connection between Warrior Bards and Blackthorn and Grimm, on the other hand, is actually a lot more direct because the characters in Warrior Bards are related to the characters from the Blackthorn and Grimm series. You don't necessarily have to understand that connection in order to understand what happens in Warrior Bards, but Warrior Bards will undoubtedly spoil some stuff that happens in Blackthorn and Grimm. So if you're ever planning on reading Blackthorn and Grimm, you should not read Warrior Bards first because it is a little bit spoilery. So I think there are actually many reasons why you should not start with Warrior Bards if you are looking into Juliette Marilli's works, not only because like chronologically it just doesn't make sense to go there first, and it's honestly not her best work, and it's not representative of the atmospheric vibe, the environmental storytelling, even just the beauty of her writing is honestly not present in Warrior Bards. It kills me a little bit to say that, but this is the case, so I don't think that Warrior Bards is a good place to start with Julia Merlier. But if you've read everything else that she's written and you're like, I just want more, then of course, check out Warrior Bards. Despite everything that I've said, I'm still going to quickly tell you a little bit about Warrior Bards. So in this series, we are following three characters. We get three character POVs in each of the books with a couple additional snippets in the third and final book, but mostly we are following Levon, Brock, and Dao, who are 
three people who are training or like applying to be part of this mercenary spy group. Similar to how in Black Throne and Grimm each book was a different mystery, in Warrior Bards each book is a different mission that the characters are going on. And then while each book is a different mission, there is an overarching magical problem within the world that covers or that spans the three books. Again, in this series, Juliette Marillier played around with the tense that the different POVs are written in, but I felt it a lot more jarring. And overall, I found the writing to just be a lot more kind of basic and straightforward, and it did not provide the beautiful descriptive setting and whimsy and atmosphere that her other books do. I did actually like the romance in this series. I won't say who it involves, obviously, and actually something that is similar with Warrior Bards and Blackthorn and Grimm is that the romance plays a much, much smaller role than it does in any of her other series. So ultimately, I just wouldn't recommend starting with this series, not only because of the chrono chronological issues with Seven Waters or Blackthorn and Grimm, but because I don't think it is representative. Okay, now for the last adult fantasy series by Juliet Murley that I'm going to be talking about today, and that is The Bridey Chronicles. This includes the three books, The Dark Mirror, The Blade of Fortrieu, and The Well of Shades. This is Juliet Murray's most historically focused historical fantasy, and along with Warrior Bards, is the one that I think is less whimsically and beautifully and environmentally written compared to her other series. And also along with Warrior Bards, it is another series that I don't actually recommend starting with if you are looking to pick up Juliet Murray books. I think this is a series that is better to pick up after you know you are already a fan of Juliet Murray, after you have read some of her some of her other works, simply because I don't think that this is going to be as much of a general crowd pleaser as the first three series that I mentioned as potential starting points. So just playing the odds, I think it is generally less likely that the average reader will pick up the Bridey Chronicles and enjoy them compared to someone who already knows they like Julia Marillier. This series is set in historical Pictland, and it is heavily inspired by particular uh, by a couple particular Pictish kings that she has actually amalgamated into one main character here, which means that she has also heavily crunched the timeline of some historical events. Which may only bother you if you are a real historical junkie and you know the history that is actually being referenced here. In the first book, we are following Bridie, who is the son of a another king from a different land, but his mum is from Fortrieu, which is the picked lands that we are following in this series, and he's being raised by the king's druid Broishan. And Bridie is being raised and trained or taught specific things in order for a future goal that he has not been told about. Now, a bit of a wrench is thrown into Broishan's plans when one night the fey folk leave a very clearly fey baby on Broishan's doorstep that, Bro that Bridey finds in the middle of the night. Bridey believes that this baby has been gifted to him by the moon goddess um, of their faith, and so he basically demands that the baby is brought into the household and raised by the household. This is the character of Tula, and we do get both Bridey and Tula's perspectives in this first book, which is, of course, the dark mirror that I'm talking about. The book follows the two of them growing up and with sort of a conclusion of Bridie's future path. The writing is a lot more dense, a little bit thicker, and a lot less whimsical and beautiful than it is in the other series that I've mentioned previously. There is definitely some fey involvement and the druids do have magic, but the focus is so much less so on fairy tale or folklore elements and a lot more on the faith of the pics, and so it feels quite a bit less woodsy or atmospheric than a lot of the other books do. The expansion of the Christian faith is a huge element at play here, and the preservation of the faith of the Picts and the protection of the Pictish people is the main overarching world plot that the whole trilogy focuses on. Something really important to note going into these books is that the main characters in each of the three books is different. This is not a generational pattern. In the first book, we follow Bridie and Tula's perspectives. In the second book, Bridie and Tula almost become secondary characters that we will occasionally get their perspectives from, but we are instead focusing on two characters who were side characters in the first book. And then in the third book, The Well of Shades, there is one character um, 
from that second book that we are focusing on again. There is an inclusion of a new character and then all of the other characters that have previously been a focus of a book do get small perspectives. So it's sort of like a rounding out. While having the three books follow different characters is not unheard of for a Juliet Morelli series, obviously, as I've mentioned, the fact that this was the Bridie Chronicles really makes you think that you're going to be following Bridie the whole time. So I just think that it's really important to know that you are following different characters in the books because otherwise it can be really jarring. One final thing to note here with this series is that the age gap in the relationship in the first book is the age gap isn't significant, but the respective ages of the characters involved can be a little bit confronting. And I think that there is another uh, pretty significant age gap in the relationship in the third book as well. On that note, I'm realizing that I forgot to mention the other potentially uncomfortable age gap romance in the first series of all things. So in Daughter of the Forest, there is actually a pretty significant age gap and possibly uncomfortable just where the ages are for you at the time that the relationship takes place. So something to note, it is also something that people just don't pay attention perhaps. If you are not a reader who really, really pays attention to character ages, then you won't notice the difference. Okay, so those are all of Juliet Morelli's adult fantasy books and the series that I think you should and should not start with if you are thinking about picking up Juliet Morelli's books for the first time. I also think that you can use what I said to help direct your reading if you have picked up one, you like the series, and you're not sure where to go next. If you would like me to do this for her young adult series or her for her standalones, just let me know in the comments down below. Or if there's any particular series here that you would like a more in-depth review for, you can definitely let me know down below and I will think about doing that in the future. Let me know where you are at with Juliet Morelia. Have you read her books before? If so, which ones? Or is it something that you are looking for and which series that I mentioned today do you think you are going to start with now that I've told you a little bit about them? Well, that is it for me today. I will see you guys next time. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.